مستر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My name is Dr. Jamila bin Adi. I'm the consultant physician, president of the Internal Medicine Society, Emirates Society of Internal Medicine. It gives me the great pleasure to welcome you all in our GI update virtual event for tonight, where we will be hosting a group of experts from the gastroenterology and internal medicine. And uh, we hope that you will have uh, a very fruitful uh, evening with our experts. We will be running this uh, event tonight in collaboration with the Diqar Internist Association in Iraq. And I would, uh, it would be a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Abbas uh, Fadl Lehel, uh, the president of the Diqar Internist Association in Iraq. He is a consultant of internal medicine and an assistant professor of internal medicine college of the Medicine University of Diqar. Dr. Uh, Abbas, welcome. Welcome, Dr. Jamila. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Masa al khair wal afiyah. Jum'a mubarak ala jamia. Taban, my words in Arabic, yani, lano hai lahza la tu, yani, mumkin wa sufha, fi lahazati la tu saf wa kalimati la taktir ta abbir. عن سعادة تملأ القلوب ونحن نلتقي مع الأخوة الأعزاء الأشقاء في بلدنا الثاني الإمارات عنوان الإبداع والتألق والتطور من خلال إقامة فعالية علمية مميزة تجمعنا مع الأخوة والأخوات الأعزاء في الجمعية الإماراتية للطب الباطن طبعا من ذي قار اللي هي وسط في جنوب العراق مهد الحضارات وعنوان الإبداع ومن جواري نبي الله إبراهيم عليه السلام من أهوار الجنوب ومن دجلة والفرات إلى أبو ظبي وعجمان ودبي والشارقة وكل الإمارات العربية المتحدة تتلاقى القلوب قبل الأبدان وتتزين بطيب المشاعر والأمنيات ليكون اللقاء حضوريا قريبا إن شاء الله شكري وتقديري للأستاذ الدكتورة جميلة محمد بن عدي رئيسة الجمعية الإماراتية للطب الباطني على جهودها من أجل إنجاح هذه الفعالية العلمية المتميزة شكري وتقديري لكل الأخوة الأعزاء في الإمارات العربية المتحدة وشكري وتقديري للمحاضرين الأفاضل الأستاذ الدكتور نوال الخالدي اللي هي علم الجهاز الهضمي في العراق وهي مسؤولة البورد العربي في الجهاز الهضمي على المستوى العربي وأيضا الأستاذ الدكتور عبد العزيز النعيمي علم من أعلام الجهاز الهضمي في الإمارات العربية المتحدة شكري وتقديري للجهود المبذولة من أجل إنجاح هذه الفعالية العلمية المتميزة وشكري وتقديري لكل الحضور وكل عام وأنتم بخير وإن شاء الله النجاح والتوفيق للجميع. My great يعني my honor to great thanks to Dr. Jamila, President of Emirates Society of Internal Medicine, for this very interesting and important meeting with our society, the Qar Internal Association. With great thanks, Dr. Jamila. Thank you, Dr. Jamila. Um, we will start uh, our event today. We will be having a slight change in our schedule where Dr. Anwar will be starting, followed by Dr. Abdelaziz. Dr. Anwar Al Khaldi is a very well known consultant of gastroenterology and hepatology. Uh, she is uh, in the GIT and hepatology teaching hospital, medical city of Baghdad, Iraq. She is the head of the Arab Board of Gastroenterology Subspeciality. Dr. Nawal today will give us an interesting talk about irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, is it irritable bowel syndrome or something else? Dr. Nawal, I would give us the pleasure to uh, host you with us tonight. And uh, please, the floor is yours. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jamila. Uh, I am so honored to be part of this meeting, and I am very grateful to Dr. Abbas uh, to let me part of this uh, meeting. Uh, I don't know if the slides uh, can be seen by the others. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, when I was asked to have a, 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 a talk uh, in this meeting, uh, I asked some physicians what uh, subjects to be interested in. Uh, it was my surprise to be irritable bowel syndrome because I thought it is not a rich subject, but when I recall the cases that was misdiagnosed, 
uh, I said, no, it's very important. It might cover most of the GIT actually. So uh, it might be not a irritable bowel, it might be something else. So I will concentrate on the differential diagnosis uh, and the uh, diagnosis also. So uh, as you know that irritable bowel is a functional disorder of the GI tract, the prevalence almost 10 to 15. It is more prevalent in females as in some reference. Females are more likely to have constipation predominant as compared with males. Actually, it is very tricky to diagnose the IBS. It is no mathematical formula. Can make the diagnosis, whether pain, depression, anxiety, diarrhea, bloating, anemia, whatever, there is no mathematical formula can help us. If it is in clinical practice, making the correct diagnosis can be difficult for the IBS. Why was that? That was because the symptoms fluctuate over time, on and off. The symptoms don't always respond to appropriate therapy. So you think it is not the right diagnosis when they don't respond. Other disorders can mimic IBS. A lot of disorders we will come across. A precise biomarker does not exist. Even the guidelines and the criteria are not always employed and it is changeable. What is the clinical manifestation? The coronary stone is the abdominal pain. The abdominal pain is a crampy with variable intensity, location, character, with periodic exacerbation. So the patient keep uh, having this pain between now and then. Frequently related notification, this is one of the most important criteria in the diagnosis, uh, whether relieved or worsened with defecation, this pain. And the emotional stress and the meals may exacerbate the pain. It is associated with the bloating and increased gas production in the form of flatulence or belching. It is very common complaint to have flatulence or belching. So the second uh, symptoms that the patient might presented with is the diarrhea. Most bowel movements are preceded by lower abdominal cramping pain. He, the patient will have pain and then he will pass the motion. He has urgency sometimes. And there is sensation of incomplete evacuation. The patient keep telling you that I go now uh, between now and then to the toilet and I feel there is more stool to pass. This is what we can call incomplete evacuation and tenismus. Bowel movements generally occur during waking hours. Most of the patients when wake up in the morning, he feel that he will go to the toilet two to three, four times, and then that's it. All the day he will be better. And others in the other way, they might have after each meal, he pass motion. He keep telling you, whenever I eat, I will go to the toilet. The other things that make the patient feeling frightened is the mucus discharge. Maybe the physician said, oh, it is just a mucus. Actually, it is not like this. The mucus discharge is ranging from the most serious diagnosis, the colorectal cancer, to the ulcerative colitis, to the solitary rectal ulcer, to the most simplest diagnosis, the irritable bowel syndrome. Simple for the patient, but not for, for uh, not having uh, complication. How to diagnose this uh, uh, bowel motion? We talked about diarrhea and also the constipation. There is a Bristol stool form scale. Should be used to record the stool consistency. Actually, it's not that much complicated and it can be applied in real life because in, the, uh, in constipation type one and type two, the type one, the patient telling you that he has pellet stool, it's like karate, little balls. Uh, or it can be sausage shaped but lumpy. While in constipation, uh, type six and type seven at the bottom of the uh, of the picture, we can see that type six it will be the stool will be fluffy and mushy. While in type seven it will be watery. So it will be easy to uh, say this is the area of irritable bowel. According to this, the, the irritable bowel syndrome was 
uh, divided into three subtypes, into four subtypes actually. Uh, for the, uh, this is when the patient medication is not used to treat the bowel habit. Otherwise, if he use laxative or antidiarrheal, uh, the uh, subtypes will not be uh, identified uh, properly. So uh, the types will be IBS drop, uh, predominant constipation, we call it IBSC. The patient report constipation, as I mentioned, type 1 and type 2 in Bristol, while in the diarrhea, uh, the, it will be in Bristol type 6 and 7, as I showed in the picture uh, before this slide. The other two, the, the first one is IBSM, which is mixed type, sometimes constipation, sometimes diarrhea, while the IBSU unclassified, it full, full the criteria of irritable bowel, but uh, uh, can uh, cannot be uh, one of the other three subtypes, different from those that I just mentioned. So uh, we just talked about how the patient will present, yet there is red flags for other symptoms that we should ask all the patient about because it is red flag alarming symptoms. Like if the symptoms is still refractory or worsening or progressive, this is not irritable bowel please be careful about the age. And if there is blood in the stool, if there is iron deficiency, weight loss always significant. If there is organic history like celiac, irritable uh, ulcerative colitis or inflammatory bowel disease, or there is family history of colorectal cancer, we should be very cautious to ask this family history. Always, as I mentioned, it's at waking hours, especially in the morning. Uh, while nocturnal will be more with organic disease rather than irritable bowel. Ask the patient if the diarrhea at night. Of course, melina is organic. Uh, if the history is short also, this will be not with irritable bowel. Please ask the patient if has oral ulcer. When you examine him, if there is palpable mass. And uh, most of the time, if the C-reactive protein is high, or the fecal caloprotectin lactoferrin is positive, those it means there is some organic disease. If the patient I mentioned progressive deterioration, or of course fever will not be irritable bowel, and if the diarrhea is steatorrhea, so this is malabsorption. So please, or small bowel uh, diarrhea, please ask the consistency, whether it is a smelly, greasy, this will not be irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, if the diarrhea will continue after 24 hour fast, it's also will not be irritable bowel. So sometimes we ask the patient to fast long time and to see, or he will not eat and to see if he will have diarrhea or not. Or not. As I mentioned, the, we face a lot of problems to diagnose irritable bowel syndrome. A lot of criteria guidelines were arrested. Here is the Manning uh, criteria, it's not used by now. Another score for diagnosis also not used, but by now we use the ROM4 criteria. Before ROM4, for, of course, there was one, two, three. The three was changed to four. This ROM criteria, I think not that much difficult to apply in clinical practice because you will just ask the patient if you have abdominal pain and this abdominal pain is recurrent. As you can see, they delete the word discomfort as in ROM three, it was discomfort. By now it is a pain. Before it was at least three days a month. By now the frequency was changed uh, and it was at least one day per week in the last three months. I will say it in Arabic, in the last three months, almost every week, the pain associated with two or more of the following. We can see that uh, the abdominal pain related to defecation. Before, they said it is improved by defecation. By now, it might increase or improve. Both of them belong to wrong four criteria or it is associated with change, whether in the frequency or in the form of a stool. So it's not that much difficult, just pain with frequency change in a stool, and this pain, whether related to notification or not. Even if we are in rush, we can ask these questions. This criteria for the last three months with symptom onset at least six months prior to diagnosis. Short duration, please be very cautious if it is short duration. 
Is there lab test to diagnose? No clear diagnostic markers exist for irritable bowel. Thus, the diagnosis of, the dis of this disorder is based on a clinical presentation and exclusion of organic causes. Be a good physician, a good historic history. History in IBS is the most important, as many symptoms of IBS are also common in organic disorder. There is a lot of overlap between irritable bowel syndrome and other organic disorders. And never forget, common is common. So if there is two common disease. There is two uh, presentation. So sometimes they say, in spite of all these criteria and the uh, ROM4 criteria, it might be a disease of exclusion. The purpose then, we said no lab test, but why we send some lab tests? The purpose of the laboratory testing is primarily to exclude an alternative diagnosis. So we will send for CBC, C-reactive, ESR, fecal calprotectin, fecal lactoferrin, you know those, it means there's inflammation in the colon, in the bowel, stool testing, GRD is very important. And though there is no statistic, I think GRD in Iraq is common over for amoeba or other parasites. And you should look in the general stool, which is very simple test, look for pus and the blood. And never, never forget celiac as a differential diagnosis for IBS and same for serology. Also, alkytrolite if the diarrhea is very severe. But recently, the Americans say there is a, pos a, a possible diagnostic rule of antibody to cytolethal distending uh, toxin B, CDTB, and antivenicullin, but still requires confirmation before they can be used. There is a hope there might be a test that can help us for this dilemma. One study evaluated this two tests, anti-CDTB and anti-vinculin uh, titers in more than 2,000 patients with IBS diarrhea. So this test for the diarrhea found that patients with this test were significantly higher in IBS diarrhea as compared to patients with. That's good. They took the inflammatory bowel and they took healthy controls, celiac disease patients, and IBS constipation. Yet, yet, both were of low sensitivity. What other lab tests we might need? If the patient have weight loss, never forget thyroid function test and the blood sugar, stool examination for fatty globuli, globule because of malabsorption. And please, as I keep saying the age, if over the age of 40 or 45, colorectal cancer screening in all patients. In patients with constipation, uh, abdominal radiograph. This abdominal radiograph, simple, cheap test, you will never imagine a lot of patients will have fecal impaction, especially in both extreme age in child and in elderly. So it will help you to know what's going on. And of course, if there is a rectal manometry and balloon expulsion testing, it should be done. Balloon expulsion testing, you can see that there is more pain in patients with irritable bowel syndrome than those who are healthy. And thanks God, by now, uh, anorectal manometry and balloon expulsion testing is available in Iraq in different uh, centers. Uh, additional evaluation based on the presence of alarm features that I just mentioned, for each that alarm features, we should send a test according to that one. Most patients will ultimately have a negative evaluation, unfortunately. It will be negative evaluation, which is which more in favor of irritable bowel. Oh, still we are looking for our way, where to go. So we should come across the differential diagnosis, which we will start with the major scary differential diagnosis like carcinoma of the colon. When I, the, when I had a patient, though he will full, full the criteria of ROM4 criteria, abdominal pain related to identification, change in bowel, but if I found his age is more than, let us say 45 or even below as the screening is all over the, Award by now is uh, less than before, so I will ask for colonoscopy. 
it is for screening, even if it will not be carcinoma of the colon, which is still a differential diagnosis. The second big, big differential diagnosis, sometimes the physician will miss it, but I guess the patient, the radiologist will not miss it by ultrasound is the ovarian cancer. It is well known ovarian cancer can present it with distension, with the bloating, though, in this case, there is no day-to-day -day variability characteristic for IBS. Never forget IBS, not always have the symptoms, day on day variable. The other also so important is the pancreatic cancer and pancreatic insufficiency, which I think if we did some tests like stool tests or a good ultrasound, it might help us to know. We can send for serum like this, serum amylase, as I mentioned, according to the differential diagnosis, we can expand the lab test. Carcinoid tumor, thanks, it is not that common. Oh, the most important differential diagnosis is the inflammatory bowel disease. Indeed, a large study in Canada suggested that, look, 8.6 of patients referred to secondary care who met the Rome 3 criteria at that time turned out to have Crohn's disease. In Canada, it is 8.6. So in our countries, uh, it will be much more. Actually, this diagnosis, the inflammatory bowel disease, mostly the Crohn's disease, the one that made me present this uh, talk because a lot of patients was diagnosed for a lot of months, years, as a case of irritable bowel syndrome, just good ultrasound or good CT scan with contrast can find that the patient has some thickened ileum, some thickened colon, which can help us for the diagnosis and proceed to colonoscopy to confirm the diagnosis. Where, wherever, whenever you do colonoscopy, please don't forget to do ileal intubation in such scenario. By now, uh, Crohn's and even ulcerative colitis is so much increasing in Iraq uh, because of course the good radiologist and because also the incidence and westernization, whatever you know, the theory of inflammatory bowel disease is not stable up till now. Microbial dairy in our territory, in our area, Arabic area, many of the microbia can cause uh, uh, diarrhea, but most of it's self-limited. Yet there is Campylobacter sometimes, or the Yersinia can continue for years. And also amoeba, if not treated, Giardia as well, there is refractory Giardia infection may have a protracted course and are to be differentiated from irritable bowel. Try sometimes, if the patient can tolerate the treatment of GRDA, I think and in our lab in Iraq as real data, it's difficult to diagnose by lab. Sometimes we need to, to treat uh, in spite of not having confirmation for the diagnosis. Cholelithiasis, this is the, mis the miserable diagnosis. Why? The pain in patient with irritable is poorly localized. It's not, no specific uh, 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 part of the abdomen to be localized, but may in some cases be right upper quadrant or epigastric, which can lead to confusion with biliary pain. The pattern of pain is also, so, also helpful. Biliary pain is typically very episodic with weeks of freedom. There is uh, time between each uh, attack of the biliary pain, while an irritable bowel, only a few days free from pain before the next flare occurs. Relief on defecation may help to distinguish between the two. So please always ask this. And the disastrous is when the patient come to you asking for uh, uh, severe pain and uh, they told me there is a gallstone, I need to remove my gallbladder and the surgeon, unfortunately, they will do the cholecystectomy with its complication for unnecessary cause. And they don't tell the patient that they may have uh, persistent symptoms because of irritable bowel, very similar to biliary pain. And also we have another things related to cholelithiasis, the post-cholecystectomy pain, which may reflect the presence of pre-existing unrecognized IBS. So they are together. When you remove the gallbladder, the symptoms will uh, continue because of the irritable bowel syndrome. And we will talk about the bile acid diarrhea after the cholecystectomy. Uh, 
For the carbohydrate intolerance, another diagnosis, it is estimated up to 30 of the patients actually are suffering from carbohydrate intolerance, which I don't think in Iraq it is as such. It is more common than this. Because our mentor, the late Zuhair Qasir, told us that the Iraqi may reach up to 70% having uh, uh, carbohydrate or lactase intolerance. So uh, it, this will be very simple question to the patient. Just tell him, do you drink milk? If he will say yes, and it will cause a lot of uh, trouble to me, okay? Simply stop taking milk. And by now there is lactase that the patient can take it if he is he, uh, like to continue drinking milk. Therefore, a very careful dietary history a trial of carbohydrate restriction, or you want to do hydrogen breath study for lactase and for sucrase may help you to establish the diagnosis. Uh, I think this is, uh, can save money a lot for the patient, just change their food. Uh, celiac, one of the most important uh, differential diagnosis because up to now we are in the iceberg only for the diagnosis of celiac. Uh, sometimes we cannot uh, depend on the uh, serology actually, I should uh, confess that because the lab, we cannot trust most of them. So sometimes we need to do upper endoscopy and D2 biopsy to, to confirm the diagnosis even if the serology is negative. And just ask the patient if he has mouth ulcer, he, he has just arthritis, sometimes they have dermatitis herpetiformis, so all can add it, some signs and symptoms to the diagnosis. Oh, new diagnosis, a new disease, a new recognition, the superior mesenteric artery syndrome. Very interesting subject. A lot of, especially young, thin females, they come have uh, refractory vomiting, they have refractory bloating. Uh, by now, why it is more in Iraq? Because our radiologists, by now they can even recognize it by ultrasound on the CT. They keep thinking about it so they will find it. Look to the picture, look to the duodenum, which looks like a circle, and to the angle of the uh, superior mesenteric artery uh, out of the aorta, how it is in the normal. Uh, this is the normal, the, uh, this is the angle, while in the superior mesenteric, it will be a, a, a short angle, a narrow angle, it will compress the duodenum. So when it compresses the duodenum, the patient will suffer from vomiting, abdominal pain, or other symptoms. So by now we have a lot of cases of superior mesenteric artery syndrome. What about SIBO, this attractive name abbreviation, a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? Uh, it is a missed disease actually. By now in Iraq also start to have this breath test for SIBO, though in very limited centers in Baghdad, but it is available. And this, uh, the patient like irritable bowel. They have a bloating, they have abdominal cramping, they have diarrhea or constipation. One of the Egyptian uh, interviewer, a very famous one, she has a lot of surgery done to her misdiagnosis in England. Then she has told to have SIBO. She keep telling what is SIBO. Other differential diagnosis is the bile acid malabsorption. Bile acid malabsorption, a lot of types actually, uh, there's uh, one of them is idiopathic, but one of the most popular is the post cholecystectomy. I, I am sure a lot of you uh, had patients who came to you saying that after cholecystectomy, I have a diarrhea, or before when the DU was treated by surgery, post vagotomy. So those, or Crohn's, because the terminal ileal will be affected and there will be no bile acid mal uh, reabsorption. So they will have bile acid malabsorption and they will have this diarrhea, which can be diagnosed by the CHCAT test. Uh, and the Quisram by now is the treatment of choice here, while in, in irritable bowel syndrome, uh, the uh, cholestyramine or the Quisram is not actually preferable uh, medicine to be treated this patient. Other is the intestinal pseudo-obstruction. 
I had some patient who came saying, I am having a bloating, severe bloating, severe distension of my abdomen with constipation. They told me this is irritable bowel. Actually, this is intestinal pseudo obstruction, which can be on and off. You all know about the diabetes and the autonomic dysfunction and the complication of it. The scleroderma can cause also such uh, symptoms similar to the uh, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, diabetes also, uh, diverticulitis, functional diarrhea, functional constipation, all these can be uh, uh, differential diagnosis of. F uh, FMF, there will be fever, hyperelasticity, skeletal abnormality, very easy to know. Endometriosis, difficult to be diagnosed. Uh, the gyne should help us. Psychiatric disorder, always with the diagnosis. Microscopic colitis for the endoscopist. Uh, don't forget to take biopsy, even if the colonoscopy is normal, if the patient have diarrhea. A lot of drugs can cause diarrhea or microscopic colitis, like proton pump, antibiotic, antidepressant, mannitol, laxative abuse. All this should be mentioned in the history. Uh, dietary factors, sorbitol, fructose, caffeine, alcohol, and fat. Uh, those are uh, coexistent with the uh, uh, irritable bowel syndrome. The functional dyspepsia all together are almost equal associated with psychiatric disorder. I should keep mention the differential diagnosis, never forget it. I don't uh, mind if you will tell me uh, stop here, uh, the time is finished because I what my message is the differential diagnosis. Yet, if I can go through the treatment, I will go through. Please assure the patient regular exercise, good chewing and not to eat fast, avoid chewing gum. All the patients chew gum thinking that when they burp, it will be easier for them. They don't know it is a cause. Avoid talking while eating. Diet modification, it's very important. Sometimes lactose, gluten is also uh, insoluble fiber. Food map is very uh, common uh, uh, issue for the irritable bowel syndrome. Patient high uh, should stop taking high food map food. A lot of food is uh, gas forming. They should know it. Actually, I made a list in the clinic. I cannot tell them a lot, all the food that might trigger the bloating. Uh, spicy food, sorbitol also, kahul, sorbitol, fructose, spicy food, coffee, all these are written to the GI in general. For the constipation, we should increase the fluid intake. We should have, the patient should have a high fiber diet. This is very important issue. I keep telling the patient, if you are on the Western style toilet, try to, to use the uh, Western and uh, Eastern. In Iraq, we call it Eastern, Sharqi. Here, they call it Indian style because there will be an angle will help the patient uh, uh, to defecate. If he cannot have this uh, Eastern or Indian style, just put a table uh, below the feet that it will elevate the leg. The pharmacological treatment, a lot of medicines like for bloating, for altered bowel function, for abdominal pain and discomfort. This is a very famous slide. Wherever you will look at the IBS, you will find this slide. Actually, it is a good summary for the treatment. Uh, for the bloating, we said there's food map and probiotic is very important. It can help us. And also the rifaximin local antibiotic can help for bloating and for the diarrhea also. Lopiramide can be used for diarrhea, tricyclic antidepressant, and a lot of new medication can be used for diarrhea, like eloxadoline, and uh, the antispasmodic can also be used, like mibivirine or even baclofen. And for the pain, don't forget the antispasmodic, antidepressant, allocitron, lobiprostol, linaclotide, blicanatide. Some of these drugs by now is available in, uh, in Iraq, but not all of them. For the constipation, never forget the fiber, osmotic laxative, lobiprostol, linaclotide, glicanatide, biofeedback by now is available in Baghdad recently, actually. We were unlucky long time, we don't have it. Uh, I thought I would like to talk about antidepressant in specific. 
uh, for the tricyclic antidepressant, our patient, most of them, they got sedation with it, the amitriptyline, amipramine. Uh, I keep telling the patient it will not work immediately. It takes two weeks at least to work. It causes sedation, constipation, dry mouth because of the anticholinergic effect. The SSRI, the fluoxetine can help to decrease the appetite also, sertraline can be citalopram, a lot of drugs uh, for irritable bowel containing this antidepressant also it takes three weeks to act and it can cause diarrhea so we use it uh, for the patient with constipation. Uh, deluxetine also can be used which is SNRI. So the conclusion uh, by now is the IBS chronic medical condition characterized by abdominal pain, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, passage of mucus and feeling of incomplete evacuation. We should remember the symptoms. It's very important. Etiology is unknown. Treatment is focused on relieving symptoms. According to the symptoms, pain, we will give this. Diarrhea, we will give this. Constipation, we will give this. So it is almost symptomatic treatment as there is no curing disease. Diagnosis is symptom-based with lab testing is if needed. Specific therapy are determined by individual patient symptoms. Lifestyle modification, yoga or whatever medication, uh, meditation, it can help those patients because they are under an anxiety and depression, a lot of psychiatric uh, manifestation. Possible alternative therapies may relieve symptoms. And thank you for your listening. Okay. I hope I was. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nawal. Shukran Jazeera, Dr. Nawal, على هاي المحاضرة رائعة المتميزة دائما. The second speaker, Dr. Abd Al Aziz Al Naimi, طبعا هو is well known gastroenterologist in Emirat. He is working in Tawam Hospital. And he will talk about a very interesting subject, truly, overview of H. pylori management. Dr. Abdul Aziz, Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam, Rahmatullah, Doctor. I sharefna wujudek, Dr. Abdul Aziz, and we are happy to be with you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much, Doctor. Please, Dr. Abdul Aziz, please. So. I hope that everybody can see my slide now. Yes, yes, well, I'm clear. Uh, so uh, um, I'm going to talk today uh, 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 about approach to H. pylori management because there is a lot of uh, mismanagement from us as a gastroenterologist and other uh, uh, internal medicine and primary health care physician uh, uh, in managing H. pylori uh, uh, so briefly uh, outline, I'm gonna talk about uh, origin, microbiology, epidemiology, patho uh, pathogenesis, etiology, the burden of the disease, diagnosis and staging, what are the international and also regional uh, treatment guidelines. Uh, uh, also, I'm gonna talk about antibiotic resistant and bismuth-based quadruple, and what are the factors predicting the successful eradication of H. pylori. So briefly about uh, uh, H. pylori, it's an organism was first observed more than 100 years back. It's a spiral shaped organism, which was visualized in the gastric mucosa layer. Uh, uh, initially it was seen in 1982 uh, by Marshall and Warren, and they uh, identified and culture a, a gastric combylobacter. Uh, and in 1985, they found this organism can cause a, a peptic ulcer. In 1989, it was named a Helicobacter pylori. And in, in 2005, uh, a Nobel Prize awarded to Marshall and Warren for, this, their, for their discovery. <clears throat> so this uh, uh, organism has a, a special shape, uh, character, uh, character where she has a flagella adhesive, and we will talk about it in the next uh, uh, slide. So it's a spiral-shaped uh, gram-negative bacteria. Uh, uh, it's a motile bacteria, uh, and it's a microaerophilic, and has positive urease and oxidase catalase. Uh, uh, 
So the epidemiology, uh, H. pylori is a common chronic bacterial infection in the human. Approximately 50% of the world population is affected. Uh, the prevalence of H. pylori varies by geographic location, socioeconomic status, uh, uh, ethnicity, uh, uh, and age. Uh, so in UAE, Oman, and Saudi Arabia, the prevalence estimated to be uh, 41, 49%, and 65, uh, uh, respectively. Uh, in Kuwait and Egypt, uh, 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 the prevalence was 84 and 86, and that was seen uh, uh, on the biopsy sample. So uh, the infection appear approximately two to three times higher in, uh, 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 in black compared to white population. In developing nation, the prevalence is in early childhood is 30 to 50%. And in adult, uh, 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 before age of 50, it ranged between 80 to 90 percent. And uh, apparently, infection rate does not differ with the gender, whether it's a, a male or a female. So this is uh, uh, prevalence across the world, whereas the, the, the countries with the highest uh, prevalence uh, uh, and there is a lot of countries with unclear, including uh, our countries. This is a small study done in, in, in Dubai, uh, 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 looking at the prevalence of H. pylori in 35th healthy asymptomatic res uh, resident. And you can see uh, uh, the results across the Arabs, the Asian and Africans uh, 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 in this study. So in Saudi Arabia, the overall prevalence uh, uh, among the studies were like 46%. Uh, 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 percent. Uh, and it was 54% among Saudi patients with uh, dyspepsia in certain area in Saudi Arabia. In Kuwait, the prevalence of H. pylori infection uh, uh, in patients with dyspepsia is around 49.7%. And there is several uh, like study done in the, uh, in the Middle East, which look at it at ranging, uh, it varies around 50%. So how does H. pylori uh, 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 transmit? So uh, uh, by contaminated water supplies, person-to-person, uh, -person, uh, fecal-oral uh, uh, through diarrhea or vomitus, or person-to-person -person in intrafamiliar uh, clustering for infection. It's a zoonoic. So H. pylori has a special character which has adhesion uh, uh, the adhesions to the surface, uh, so it att attached to itself to the gastric uh, 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 epithelial cells and start to colonize, and it minimizes the acid content of the uh, 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 of the stomach of the gastric wall, and it start to uh, secrete certain type of toxin which affect the uh, gastric wall. So I will go briefly about this because this is a bit uh, complicated. So what affects uh, 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 H. pylori or where we can see uh, uh, H. pylori? So the socioeconomic status uh, 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 population, uh, density of housing, lack of running water, level of education, uh, race, ethnicity, the hygiene practice, all of these uh, uh, would, could be a part of the etiology of uh, H. pylori. So in, we, we can see also increased risk of developing uh, gastric stomach in patients with H. pylori, those who smokes, uh, uh, those who consume salt and meat. Uh, uh, it decreases uh, uh, the risk of developing uh, stomach cancer in patients with H. pylori, decrease in patients who consumes fruits, vegetables, and vitamins. So most of the affected individual remain asymptomatic for a long period. So what are the symptoms you will find these patients having? So uh, uh, halitosis, bad, bad breath, nausea, belching, bloating, gas. So you can see variety of uh, symptoms uh, of upper GI symptoms or uh, uh, and abdominal symptoms like 
vomiting, loss of appetite, burning, abdominal pain, and gonic. So how does it affect uh, the gastric wall? So uh, whenever the normal gastric mucosa affected by H. pylori, uh, it will cause an acute gastritis. Patient will be either symptomatic or asymptomatic. The acute will turn into a chronic and depends on from where is the dominant gastritis. If it's antral prodominant gastritis, it will cause a duodenal ulcer, plus uh, it can cause a mouth lymphoma. If it's a corpus uh, a predominant gastritis, uh, it can cause a gastric ulcer or, or uh, in a rare condition, gastric uh, cancer. Uh, we can see here the extra uh, uh, gastric uh, uh, findings that associated with uh, H. pylori, Rain, ranging from uh, 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 idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, multiple sclerosis, ischemic heart disease, asthma, nephild, uh, insulin resistance, celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and anemia. So burden of uh, uh, H. pylori, the mortality rate is approximately 2 to 4% uh, uh, percent in all infected uh, people. But, you know, the mortality is... Uh, mainly due to the complication of infection rather than directly by the infection. Uh, the morbid morbidity of H. pylori infection can be very high, and the prognosis is usually excellent, even in a patient with complication. Uh, now, the prognosis is poor for squamous cell esophageal cancer and gastric carcinoma. And uh, this is a, a, a very important, uh, uh, I would say, sentence. So the rate of reinfection is very low, uh, uh, one to two percent. We come across a lot of patients in the clinic who, who, were, who, who were treated for H. pylori and they are negative and they ask, maybe I uh, was reinfected again, I still have symptoms. So again, the rate of reinfection is very low and it is between one and two percent. Uh, apparently, Children and females have a higher uh, incidence of reinfection because uh, they live in the same family, they eat from the same dish, uh, so the reinfection is higher, 5 to 8 percent. So, in whom we should test for uh, H. pylori? And these are uh, uh, active peptic ulcer disease, a patient with history of peptic ulcer, a patient who's diagnosed with gastric mouth lymphoma, or a patient uh, 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 in endos who had an uh, endoscopic resection of, uh, 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 I would say, early gastric cancer, uh, dyspepsia, uh, uh, when an upper endoscopy is undertaken, or a patient who will be initiated on a, a chronic uh, treatment uh, of NSAID. Another indications which have conditional recommendation, but we always uh, uh, test these patients for H. pylori. So un uh, uninvestigated dyspepsia, with dyspepsia without alarm symptoms, and investigated dyspepsia with alarm, without alarm symptoms in a patient less than uh, uh, 60 years old, or a patient uh, long-term uh, low-dose aspirin to reduce ulcer and bleeding risk, and a patient with unexplained iron deficiency anemia, a patient also with ITP. So what we should do before testing these patients? These medications should be stopped and discontinued before doing any type of testing, except uh, 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 the direct uh, uh, histology testing during endoscopy. So, uh, medication PPI should be stopped two weeks before testing and antibiotic and bismuth should be stopped four weeks before testing patients. And these will affect the sensitivity uh, uh, of the test. So this is an algorithm uh, 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 for the, whom we should uh, test for H. pylori. Uh, uh, I will go uh, briefly, I will pass to the next slide. So what are the available uh, uh, modality of testing H. pylori? We have an uninvasive testing ranging, uh, ranging between urea breath test, stool antigen test, or serology, which we don't use uh, uh, in our countries. 
uh, uh, or we have an invasive uh, endoscopy like a rapid ureus test, the histology, or uh, uh, the difficult test, which is a culture. You can see here the example of uh, uh, non-invasive testing for H. pylori. So we have uh, one of the commonest uses, urea breath test. It's highly predictive results, easy to collect and handle, uh, a gold standard for asymptomatic patient. The disadvantage is, is low false uh, or, or false negative results, the low accuracy in a patient who has a gastric cancer or metaplasia. Soil antigen is also a, a test, is only high, highly uh, predictive results and used for initial diagnosis and also it can be used for test of cure. Also, it has a false negative rate. Serology testing, it is an in, uh, inexpensive and easy and highly predictive. The problem is, especially in our countries, because the prevalence of H. pylori is very high, so a lot of patients will have antibodies and we don't, we cannot test uh, uh, for a uh, response uh, on medication because these patients will have a positive serology for the rest uh, uh, of their life. And it's difficult to, to, to evaluate if it's an active disease or it's a past uh, infection. These are the invasive tests which done uh, by gastroenterologists during endoscopy the rapid urease test, the CLO test, the histology, uh, uh, and uh, uh, a culture, which is like very expensive, time consuming, and it's required skills. Uh, what about the treatment of H. pylori? So here uh, I will come across uh, uh, four uh, uh, guidelines, uh, uh, three international and one uh, local uh, uh, guidelines in the uh, in the region. So in 2017, I will talk about the American uh, College of Gastroenterology guidelines. In 2016, I will talk about the Toronto consequences of treatment of H. pylori. And uh, in 2022, uh, I will uh, present uh, uh, the Maastricht uh, uh, six consequences. And uh, 2022, also, I will come across the Saudi guidelines for treatment of uh, H. pylori. So the American uh, 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 College of Gastroenterology recommended uh, these treatment for H. pylori ranging between uh, 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 trip, the well-known common the triple uh, 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 clarithromycin-based treatment, which well-known for us, PPI, clarithromycin amoxicillin, the bismuth uh, uh, quadruple and the concomitant. So the concomitant, uh, because I'm gonna mention in the next slide concomitant uh, uh, treatment. So the concomitant is the same triple therapy, adding to it uh, uh, metronidazole. <coughs> so the American College of Gastroenterology, one of their recommendation uh, uh, is a PPI, bismuth, tetracycline and metronidazole which was uh, not approved by FDA. However, the Pylera combination product was approved. <coughs> so what do they recommend <coughs> in a patient uh, uh, for treatment of uh, H. pylori? So if a patient is well known to have a penicillin allergy, if it's yes, we have to check if the patient has previous maclor, mac, uh, maclor, uh, 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 clarithromycin like uh, uh, exposure. If it's yes, the treatment is like bismuth uh, quadruple. If no, we can consider uh, uh, triple therapy, uh, 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 removing the, the, uh, the uh, amoxicillin, adding uh, amitronidazole. If there is no penicillin allergy, then we can uh, uh, give him uh, uh, either triple therapy or uh, bismuth-based therapy. Now, the uh, Maastricht uh, uh, six uh, uh, guidelines looked into deep uh, into these uh, recommendations, and they come with a recommendation that in a 
in, in, a, in a countries with low prevalence of clarithromycin resistant, and they mean by low prevalence is 15%, still triple eradication therapy can be uh, uh, recommended uh, as, a, as, as a first line, but also a bismuth-based quadruple therapy uh, 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 can be prescribed as a first line. Now, this, they have a statement regarding this, that in order to say that we are a country with a, a, a low clarithromycin resistant, you have to have a proven study that your country uh, is a uh, has a low clarithromycin resistant, uh, uh, resistant in order to prescribe a triple. Because nowadays, globally, we consider most of the countries uh, uh, are, uh, uh, have high clarithromycin resistance. So again, I will mention that in areas with a, a low clarithromycin resistant, uh, uh, bismuth quadruple therapy or clarithromycin containing triple can be recommended if proven effectively locally. So, uh, 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 and they mentioned in, in their guidelines that there are few areas remaining with low uh, clarithromycin resistant, uh, uh, with a few ex uh, exceptions worldwide in the presence of resistant prohibits and pericues of uh, triple therapies containing uh, uh, clarithromycin. So in order to use triple therapy, you have to prove that your country has a, 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 a low clarithromycin resistance. Otherwise, by definition, the whole world, except few countries, have high clarithromycin resistance, which is more than 15%. And therefore, triple therapy is no longer recommended as a first line. So uh, uh, here they recommend the first line is the concomitant therapy, which I mentioned before, or the bismuth uh, uh, quadruple therapy. And then they go, uh, if, if it's failed, they will go according to the algorithms. So again, quadruple or non-bismuth quadruple or concomitant uh, 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 therapy is PPI clarithromycin amoxicillin, which is the triple, adding to it metronidazole. So an individual uh, susceptibility, uh, susceptibility testing is, uh, uh, if individual susceptibility testing is not available, and this is what uh, in, in our countries, I would say, so first line recommended treatment is quadruple, whether it's a bismuth or non-bismuth. Here also they commented, uh, they, they, they comment about concomitant therapy is ineffective if your country has both uh, clarithromycin and uh, metronidazole therapy. And therefore they recommended in these countries, uh, a, a bismuth uh, quadruple as a first line treatment, uh, uh, as a first line uh, uh, therapy. So again, because of increasing failure of therapy, the consequences group strongly recommended that all H. pylori eradication regimen now to be given on in, uh, for 14 days. Uh, and they recommend quadruple therapies as a first line. So please don't ever use any, don't use triple therapy as a first line anymore. And you can choose both either a concomitant non-bismuth quadruple therapy or bismuth quadruple therapy. What about, uh, do we have a regional uh, uh, guidelines? Uh, we have a, a recent last uh, year, we have a Saudi, uh, a Saudi published uh, uh, guidelines in the treatment of uh, H. pylori. And they commented in their uh, guidelines, the rate of clarithromycin and metronidazole resistant is very high. And therefore, standard triple therapy for, for 10 to 14 days is no longer recommended in the treatment of H. pylori. And based on the available data, 
bismuth quadruple therapy for 10 to 14 days is considered as the best first and second line uh, therapy. And this is their recommendation. If a patient tested for H. pylori, the first line treatment uh, when there is no penicillin is uh, no penicillin allergy is uh, bismuth quadruple, or we have a formula called uh, pylera. I'm not sure if it's available in Iraq or no, uh, 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 as a, a first line treatment. The second treatment, uh, second line treatment is again uh, bismuth based uh, therapy or pylera, or you can go uh, for alternatives uh, like a, a levofloxacin uh, based therapy or high dose dual therapy or rifambutin uh, 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 based treatment. In a patient with penicillin allergy, again, the treatment is bismuth based quadruple therapy whether if it's available in your country as separate or it's available in a formula called Pylera with all the medicine available in, in a single tablet. So this is a slide showing the clarithromycin resistant uh, uh, across the globe. And in, in most of the country, which is like tested, you can see that the, cl the clarithromycin resistant consider as high. Most of the world, we don't have enough data and you can see here the uh, uh, increase uh, 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 resistant over the years uh, across uh, the globe. And you can see most of the countries now, they are more than 15% uh, resistant. What about, do we have a, a resistant in the, in the Middle East? These are uh, uh, some of the published data in Egypt, Iran, Iraq, uh, uh, Saudi, Tunisia, and UAE, and in, all of them the, that the clarithromycin resistant is above uh, 15%. What about also uh, uh, metronidazole uh, resistant? You can see here also uh, the resistant is uh, continually going up. And this is across uh, 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 the Middle East countries. So, H. pylori eradication with a capsule containing bismuth, metronidazole, tetracycline, adding to it uh, 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 omeprazole versus, uh, this is a study done uh, comparing the bismuth base and, 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 and the uh, uh, triple base uh, uh, therapy. And they compare both the uh, uh, omeprazole, amoxicillin, and clarithromycin for 10 days, and the quadruple therapy with PPI for 10 days. And you can see here uh, uh, the result in both uh, 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 groups that uh, bismuth, a quadruple bismuth based therapy has a much higher uh, eradication rate compared to uh, uh, the uh, standard uh, triple therapy. So I will go quickly because we don't have a, a, a lot of time. So I'll try to finish as, as fast as, as we can. So this is, they looked into a lot of uh, physician as a gastroenterologist, they comment about the side effect of uh, a bismuth based quadruple therapy. And you can see they compare it with the standard therapy and most of the side effects are very well tolerable and comparable between both groups. And here uh, 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 in the study, which they looked comparing both the, the uh, quadruple bismuth uh, based therapy and the triple, they said quadruple therapy should be considered as a first line in the view of rising prevalence of clarithromycin resistant. So these are some study which looked into uh, uh, a medicine called pylera, which is like easier form of uh, uh, quadruple uh, uh, bismuth-based uh, therapy. So again, they commented as single capsule bismuth quadruple eradicate H. pylori in approximately 90% of patients in a real uh, uh, world clinical practice with favorable uh, safety profile. 
So here uh, also a study which happens uh, uh, in Kuwait looking at the same uh, uh, form of medicine, uh, which is a, a quadruple therapy and they compare it with the standard therapy. And you can see here that quadruple therapy has a higher uh, 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 eradication rate comparing to triple therapy. So do we have room for improvement? So this is a room for improvement study which happened in the European registry uh, on H. pylori management. And this is, they looked into a gastroenterologist management of uh, uh, H. pylori. And you can see until the publication, until the study that 46% of the, of, of the treatment, they use a standard triple therapy, which is, consider as ineffective. And 69% still they give the, uh, the, the eradication therapy for uh, seven to uh, 10 days compared to their recommended duration, 10 to 14 days. Uh, uh, also 48% 48, uh, 48 they use a single dose PPI, low dose P PPI rather than uh, uh, BID. So what is my take home message? So triple therapy is no longer recommended in a countries with a high clarithromycin resistance, which I think most of our countries are part of this uh, group. And bismuth-based quadruple therapy is a part of first line therapy for H. pylori. Concomitant quadruple therapy can be considered as a treatment for H. pylori and if a patient failed two treatments, two eradication attempts, this patient should be referred for, to a gastroenterologist to consider uh, H. pylori culture. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abdelaziz, for this a very interesting presentation, truly, Annie. Uh, Dr. Jamila uh, Dakat Mojude for start question. Yes. Dr. Nawal, Mojude, Dr. Nawal, Stada Nawal. Naam, Naam. Naam. Stada Jamile. Thank you very much for this uh, very rich uh, presentations from both speakers, Dr. Nawal, Dr. Abdul Aziz. Thank you very much. Um, I would start with my first question to Dr. Nawal. Um, Dr. Anawal, you know that many patients start uh, having symptoms of irritable bowel at a younger age, and uh, these symptoms would continue with them for a long time. Um, do you think that we should uh, start investigating them for other causes of abdominal pain if they grow in age, like past the age of 50, or would, uh, I mean, is it warranted to do it? Or should we wait for new symptoms to develop in order to investigate? Um, though irritable bowel syndrome is a common disease, but from my, uh, let us say, humble experience, a lot of cases by now is not irritable bowel syndrome. For my experience, I, recommend investigation, investigating those patients, uh, especially if they are young. You know, in our area, celiac is common, lactase deficiency is common, bad habit like uh, uh, food with uh, uh, sucrose, uh, sorbitols, like uh, uh, soft drinks, like junk foods, all those are uh, uh, though risk for irritable bowel, but yet it is indication also for uh, other conditions which can be as an etiology. So yes, we need to investigate them, especially if they are complaining on and off and the, it is progressively increasing and uh, the patient cannot tolerate. Uh, I have a question to my professor, Dr. Nawal. Uh, how we can يعني, use fecal caloprotectin in practice, how value of it is to differentiate irritable bowel from the other organic cause of uh, uh, GIT colon? Uh, by now, because of the significance, if the lab is good and precise, 
because of the yes. significance of calprotectin to indicate that there is inflammatory process, I recommend all the patient with irritable bowel syndrome diarrhea to get this test. Yes. Uh, is the titer is the, is a value or just a positive or negative? Uh, it should be titer, especially uh, titer. to begin yes. with, to begin with, if it is just positive, it is of course of help. But if you want, for example, an inflammatory bowel disease, positive will not help you at all. It should be a titer. But to start with, if you want to diagnose, if it's only a positive or negative, so it will, it can help you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Sarah Jamil, start the questions. Yeah, uh, there is a question here uh, that says, uh, that there are a lot of patients who cannot tolerate pilera. What is the management of these patients? This is for Dr. Abdelaziz's question. Yes, uh, uh, so again, we give both uh, uh, option in these patients. You can give them a, a, a quadruple, uh, uh, either a bismuth-based or a non-bismuth-based. So if the patient, if, if, if you have pilera available in your clinic or in your area, you can use it if you don't have just use the, uh, the simple triple eradication, adding to it metronidazole twice a day uh, for a total of 14 days, and that will take care of it. Pylera is available in Iraq, but actually it is expensive. Yes. Also, also in UAE, it's available and it's, uh, it's uh, expensive. So. Uh, uh, we use in a lot of patients uh, uh, if in, in, who, who will pay by themselves, we use a, a, a quadruple uh, non-bismuth-based non therapy, a concomitant therapy. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Abdel Aziz. You said the Saudi guidelines said that uh, you can use uh, bismuth-based. You mean not pilera, though the Americans say either pilera or don't use bismuth. So the Saudi, no, the Saudi recommended uh, 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 Pilera by name, actually. Uh, so they wrote it, you know, not all the guidelines will write uh, a name of a medicine by itself. The Saudi wrote Pilera by its name in their guidelines. In America, so, uh, guideline also, right? Yes, yes, yes. In American guidelines, the Saudi guidelines, all of them, they wrote the medicine by name rather than by what the 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 what's the what's contained yeah so uh, so bismuth alone can uh, bismuth without uh, out of pilera can be used in other it can uh, be used but uh, a lot of patients actually they cannot tolerate it i mean pilera is more tolerable than uh, uh, if you give it in a separate uh, uh, medicines yes question from uh, dr ziyad waeli dr aziz uh, can we depend on serology for diagnosis and treatment of H. pylori? Uh, so, the, the, no, we cannot actually. Now, uh, uh, in a countries with low prevalence of, uh, um, of H. pylori, serology testing can be used for diagnosis. The problem is serology, you, you can't say this is uh, 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 an active infection or a past uh, infection. That's why uh, uh, we don't recommend using serology uh, 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 in our countries with high prevalence of uh, H. pylori. Okay. Um, there is one more question, but I believe it is uh, pertaining to irritable bowel. Uh, they didn't mention, but they said, when do you advise to refer a patient to gastroenterologist and how, uh, and after how long treatment, especially for young patients? I believe this is uh, for irritable bowel. I'm not quite sure. Yes. It's almost uh, similar to your questions, right, Dr. Jamila? No. Uh, but uh, uh, what I mentioned, my message was in the presentation for the uh, physicians, uh, don't uh, underestimate the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome and just a stigma that this is irritable bowel syndrome. Actually, maybe first, second uh, visits uh, refer to gastroenterology because a lot of differential 
diagnosis that I mentioned might be behind his symptoms or her symptoms. So uh, if you will ask me, I will say earlier referral is better. Uh, Dr. Jamila, a question from Dr. Mohanad Ayal to the Dr. Abdul Aziz. Thank you for a nice presentation. What is the experience of Rafa Rifabutin regime in H. pylori eradication? So Rifabutin is considered as a salvage therapy and the last uh, 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 resource to treat uh, for a treatment. So uh, uh, still, the, the I think the uh, 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 the eradication rate with rifabutin is still low, ranging between uh, 50 to 60 percent. But uh, as I say, this is a salvage therapy where most of the treatment failed, ranging between uh, quadruple uh, bismuth based or non bismuth based. Then you can try the levofloxacin based therapy. Uh, and if all of them doesn't work, then you can, uh, if it's available, you can try a, a rifabutin based. But don't forget, if a patient failed twice eradication therapy, this patient should be referred to a gastroenterologist and to consider H. pylori culture if it's available in your area. Hey, Dr. Jamil, okay, okay. Um, there is another question here, which is directed to Dr. Anawal. Uh, it states that we all know that irritable bowel disease is a disease is a diagnosis by exclusion. Uh, therefore, till date, we still see physicians diagnosing IBS through Rome three criteria. Is that which is is that somehow uh, harmful to the patient if still using the Rome three rather than the Rome four? as uh, room four is not widely used. Uh, actually, if, if you had seen the slide that I uh, compare both the three and four, you can see the difference uh, mainly on the duration and frequency of the symptoms and uh, uh, the description of the pain. And so uh, what things is added need to be verified because whenever you find patient, just ask him, do you have abdominal pain? Yes, whether increased or decreased by defecation, both by now and wrong for criteria is significant. So I think uh, uh, knowing wrong for criteria is much better because it is easier actually and more expanded than the Rome three criteria. Uh, why we do such webinars and such education for physician or for family physicians, that's just to uh, follow those things. Uh, when Whenever you keep diagnosing the patient irritable bowel, whether ROM3 or ROM4 criteria, and the patient uh, thinking of different differential diagnosis, it will be harmful, whether ROM3 or ROM4. So please keep thinking about the differential diagnosis. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. I think we'll take, two, we'll take two more questions and then uh, we'll conclude, yes, inshallah. Yes, yes. A okay. uh, question about uh, uh, Dr. Abdul Aziz. Uh, what is the regime is safest in a pregnant women with H. pylori infection, especially in our country, Iraq, with relative lower clarithromycin resistance? So uh, 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 my answer is in this, is you don't need to eradicate H. pylori in pregnant patients while you need to control the symptoms. So in, in most pregnant patients, we give them a PPI to control their symptoms until uh, they deliver safely. And based on their breastfeeding, yes or no, then we give them the treatment. So uh, no need to treat this patient. I mean, PPI by itself, will control the symptoms of uh, H. pylori infection. So the eradication can be happen later on when it's much safer on the uh, uh, baby, on the fetus, and then we can treat uh, 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 these patients. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Uh, there is a question here, which uh, I mean, I will reformulate it. I think it means uh, here that what tests do you do after uh, 
finishing the eradication for H. pylori uh, to confirm that the disease is not, uh, I mean, is eradicated. So you can do uh, non-invasive testing, you can do both the ure urea breath test or the stool uh, antigen. Both are uh, uh, good tests, both are with uh, uh, high uh, sensitivity. Okay. Uh, another question, uh, just to know what to do if H. pylori is positive even after the course of antibiotics. So, again, I didn't. What what we um, should do even uh, after the course of so again? So you give the first uh, uh, eradication. Uh, uh, you can uh, uh, then second eradication course if both are. Uh, uh, still the patient is positive, then you refer them to a gastroenterologist. So you can give first as either bismuth uh, containing quadruple or non-bismuth, and you can alternate the other as a second line of treatment. So if you give a pilero or bismuth uh, based as a first line, give concomitant as a second line. If both fail, refer to a gastroenterologist where a culture can be done, if you don't have it, you can then consider uh, levofloxacin based uh, uh, or rifambutin based therapy. And if all of them fail, then you can uh, 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 keep a patient on PPI uh, for a while. And uh, uh, let's say for a period, for a holiday of, of all eradication, and then uh, 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 try again after a while. Okay, thank you, doctor. There are maybe more than one question asking uh, about uh, the, uh, I mean, is about the, uh, the indication of eradication of H. pylori in children and the teenage group. And if there is any modified regime or a safe regime for them. So I am an adult gastroenterologist. Yeah, so I know that was. Uh, yeah, I know that, but uh, that was, it's a main concern for the doctors here. Yes. They're asking about it. So I think it's better they refer to a pediatrician for this question. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, or a pediatric gastroenterologist. Okay, okay. okay I think we would uh, conclude. I mean, we had a good number of questions here and uh, would like to thank everybody for the excellent talks that were presented today in uh, our uh, GI update webinar. And thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Dr. Anwar, for your excellent presentation. Dr. Abdul Aziz, also for the excellent presentation and the update. Dr. Abbas, thank you very much for being uh, our uh, host here also and uh, we would like to uh, uh, wait for a new and uh, continuous collaboration inshallah thank you very much for all eminent speaker thank you very much dr abdul aziz dr anawal for this very interesting informative presentation thank you dr jamil i will hope to be again in the near future inshallah in iraq and in emirat and uh, thank you very much for all people working this uh, uh, event. And great thanks to all attendants. And thank you very much, Dr. Jamila, and all. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you for you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Nice. Nice.